Welcome to Education Forum. I'm Herman Badillo, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the City University. The improvement of education affects all New Yorkers. This program will focus on the key educational issues and challenges before us all. My guest today is Nat Hentoff, who is a columnist for the Village Voice and a writer for the Wall Street Journal and for many other publications. He has published many books on uh, children, on jazz, and he has written novels, but uh, most especially, he is a foremost authority on the First Amendment, the Bill of Rights, and the Constitution of the United States, and uh, very much concerned about the students' rights. And uh, I want to, first of all, thank you for your support. Uh, <laughs> uh, when I was trying to get through the Board of Regions, which I did, the core curriculum, uh, you felt that, uh, as I did, that it was important that uh, our young people sure. get a background in American history. Tell us why. Who would have thought that you had to fight to get an American history course? Because when I was in school back in Boston, that was a standard thing to do. If you're, if you're an American, you ought to know why, where it came from. But this has been a problem throughout the country. In college, there was a survey that showed even in the elite colleges, there are no American history courses in many of them. Students know very little about it except for politically correct history. But of all things, to not have the basic, if you have an American history course, you also have to have a history of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And that's one of the areas that most concerns you, that yeah. people don't know about the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. You know, I, I've been traveling th through many high schools and colleges for many years. Unless you find a teacher or a professor, and there are not many of them, who are passionate about the subject, and can do what Justice Brennan once told me. I was going off to some rural area in Pennsylvania to talk about the Bill of Rights. He said, you gotta tell them stories. Mm -hmm. Because if you wanna get the words off the page into their lives, and once you tell a kid, why do we have a Fourth Amendment? Search and seizure, police, because the colonists before the revolution were subject to the king's offices going into their homes and offices with a general warrant. They could do whatever they wanted. They turned everything upside down, including the people inside. So the American Revolution, Brennan told me, and some historians agree, one of the precipitating causes was we got to stop the government coming in whenever they want to. You tell a kid that, then they understand why and we and have the, a fourth, the fourth amendment. The Fourth Amendment is a search and seizure, right? That's right. In other words, you can't go in and by the way, the Supreme Court just had a decision yeah. about uh, the drug uh, interdiction in the highways. Yeah, he said that that's an unreasonable search. That was encouraging. I didn't think that Sandra Day O'Connor cared that much. She wrote the, the main decision. Uh, and I, I was also in Miami a couple of years ago at a book fair, and they made you work for your publicity. Mm -hmm. So they asked me to talk to a large number of students, most of them black and Hispanic. I started to go in, and the teacher said to me, don't be offended, they're not gonna pay any attention to you on this subject because all they care about are clothes and music. So for over an hour I told them stories about why we have these rights. At the end, I was amazed, there was a standing ovation. Not for me, but they discovered America. <laughs> well, you see, the, the problem of the Bill of Rights is, I think, the uh, a continuing problem because the Bill of Rights was put into as, an amend as 10 amendments That's of the right. Constitution because uh, the uh, founding fathers did not trust the federal government. Right. And they put in things which were designed to protect the minority. That the is, individual uh, against the government, okay, sure, but, and the majority. Uh, but you see, what I find as a lawyer is that uh, uh, many people uh, today don't support the Bill of Rights. Oh, in other no. words, if you were to ask people, uh, do you believe in the... Uh, uh, in supporting, without mentioning the Fifth Amendment, yeah. you believe that people should have the right uh, not to uh, incriminate themselves. They would say no, right? That's, see, that's the problem. And when people don't know their own rights, right. then they're indifferent or hostile to others. There was a, 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 a rally at Foley, uh, where the, all the, the courthouses are downstairs, federal, state, and some eight members of the Ku Klux Klan were there. They weren't allowed to use a bullhorn. They're just standing there like schmucks. Mm -hmm. Big crowd came, and a lot of parents took their children to curse at them and yell at them. One woman in the crowd said, gee, this is America. They have a right to speak. They surrounded her. They kicked her. They hit her on the head with American flags, and a cop rescued her. 
That shows you how few Americans, at least in this city, understand the First Amendment. Or support it. For example, you remember that I was one of the negotiators in the prison riots in Attica. Right. And I was negotiating with Commissioner Oswald while the rioters were in the yard, and uh, they had made demands. And one of the demands they made is that they wanted to have a black Muslim minister. Mm -hmm. And Commissioner Oswald said no. And I said, Commissioner, did you ever hear of the case of uh, uh, Muhammad Ali against the United States? Uh -huh. The Supreme Court ruled that the black Muslim is a legitimate religion. And right. if you believe in freedom of religion, which is the First Amendment, then they're entitled to a black Muslim minister. So he conceded that uh, I was right. But here is a, uh, a lawyer who's a commissioner, and they really don't believe in freedom of religion. Well, I'm having a conflict now with the chancellor of the New York City school system. Chancellor who, Levy. He, yeah, and I thought he made a good beginning, but our conflict now is he has just banished the Boy Scouts from most of the activities in the public schools, despite the fact that last June they won a Supreme Court decision they, the Supreme Court said they have a First Amendment right of expressive association. In another case, Sandra Day O'Connor says, when you have form an association, that means you're forming a voice. And, and, and just to be sure that yeah. everyone understands, the reason that he uh, banished the Boy Scouts was because they have a rule yeah. against homosexuals, right? Yeah, and the Supreme Court said, and you know, this is something I would say too, you can't force the NAACP to admit and put into a leadership position David Duke. Agudath Israel does not have to put in Jews for Jesus. And that's a core First Amendment right, the freedom of association. The city <coughs> of New York and the Board of Education has a policy, and it's true, which says you can't discriminate because of race, gender, whatever, sexual orientation. But the First Amendment trumps that. And the Supreme Court has said so. So here he goes does the politically correct thing. And what really annoyed me was, in the old days, you know, the principal would be the head teacher. He'd give courses. Right. Howard Levy is the chief teacher of the whole system. He announces this. He doesn't say to the students or their parents or to the rest of us, let, let me tell you why I'm doing this, even though the Supreme Court said no. He doesn't mention the Supreme Court. And he doesn't Court. have a hearing, right? No hearing. This is all by him. And the, the thing, if there's ever going to be a, a suit against him, what he's done is, he not only banishes the Boy Scouts from special privileges, but he says they cannot bid on contracts with the Board of Education. All kinds of people bid on contracts. He is singling them out, which is a violation of due process. And the other thing is, has, has he or anybody else ever screened all the others? Are they discriminating? Are they discriminating against the handicapped or whatever? So this is a selective banishment of a group who has won a Supreme Court decision saying you can't do that. Well, he's not only the head teacher, but he's also a lawyer, so you yeah. should know. Um, and, and that is exactly my point. You, who are an expert on the yeah. uh, Bill of Rights and the First Amendment, why is it that so many, not just average citizens, but so many leaders in our society who say that they believe in the Constitution, who swear when they take the oath of office to support the Constitution in practice. Why do they not support the Bill of Rights? Well, it's interesting. You point out that he's, he's a lawyer. He's a very bright man. I know I met him, and I know that we both revere a man named Milton Convitz, who was an ex real expert on the Bill of Rights. But it's so tempting especially when you're a public figure, and he's not running for office, but he wants support. Now, in this city now, the politically correct thing to do is to go along with the notion that discrimination is the most important thing, and you can't discriminate against anybody, even if it violates the First Amendment. I can't go into his head, but I think that's why he did it. He's too smart not to know that the Supreme Court said the other thing. But the, but the, uh, the purpose of the Bill of Rights is to say that even if it's not politically correct, you have to support the right. rights of a minority. And uh, another thing is, I told him and his members of his staff, one of the amicus briefs to the Supreme Court uh, supporting the Boy Scouts came from a gay and lesbian organization who said, look, we're a minority. We don't want the government to tell us whom we should have in our membership. So they understood it, but he didn't. Okay, now if you, uh, who feel so passionately about the Bill of Rights, were 
to be the chancellor uh, or to be the head of a university, yeah. uh, what kind of courses would you design to make sure that the people who go to school would have the kind of support for the Bill of Rights that you believe in? Well, I'd say I do two things among others. I wouldn't necessarily go with textbooks. There are books that are very clear, very well written, and they tell you the story of so-called ordinary people who have decided out of a great need to, c to go to the Supreme Court. And you know how difficult that mm -hmm. is, especially yeah. if you don't have any money. Right. And one such book is called The Courage of Their Convictions by Peter Irons. He's a professor in California. It's out in paperback now on Penguin. And it tells you from the very beginning of each case, very important cases, who they were, they speak about it, you hear about them afterwards. Now, the other thing you can do, and I saw this once, I was in a town in, in Wyoming, where the librarian used to have brown bag lunches for ki any kid who wanted to come. She'd have a prosecutor one day, a defense attorney the next week. She had me speak. So you can feel the, you, you learn it out of life as well as out of books. Now in the city of New York, you, mm -hmm. all the kinds of people you could bring in. You could bring, I know some homicide detectives who were civil libertarians, <laughs> you know, surprising to some people. Uh, the thing is, as Brennan said, you've got to get those words into the lives of people. Now, there's a group in, in Harlem called the Neighborhood Defenders. They teach the kids what they call street law. So you should know your rights and also should know your responsibilities. If you get in trouble with a cop, is it your fault? But if, if the cop is being overly official, you ought to know what your rights are. There are so many ways to make this alive. There was a wonderful teacher in Brooklyn named Rose Reisman, had an eighth grade class black, white, all, it was United Nations kind of class. She had those kids so passionate about the Bill of Rights that the discussions were better than I ever hear on cable television. She got in trouble with her, with her superintendent of schools. She said, it's, he said, it's too controversial. Okay, we'll, we'll be back <laughs> after these announcements. I'm principal of a new kind of public school. It's open up to 15 hours a day, year-round. It has loads of academic, cultural, and recreational activities. We have medical and dental services right here. Our teachers have more time to teach. Our students are better prepared to learn. just one problem. We can't get the kids to go home. Find out how your public school can be more like this one. Call 1-877-LOVE-TO-LEARN. We're back today with Matt Hentoff, a columnist for The Village Voice, who has, uh, over the decades, been a strong supporter of the uh, Bill of Rights and especially the First Amendment. And of course, People who take the uh, point of view that you do find themselves uh, taking unusual points of view. For yeah. example, you wrote an article for the Washington Times last uh, June in which you criticized the New York Times because uh, they were not happy with the end of affirmative action programs at the universities in California. Right. Now, most people would think that you would support affirmative action. Well, what, why did you have that point of view? You know, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution guarantees every one of us equal protection of the laws. Now, years ago, Justice William O. Douglas, who was arguably the most liberal member in the court's history, gave me a lecture about affirmative action. He said, if you find an individual student can be white, American Indian, black, whatever, that student has had a dysfunctional family or lived in poverty but has shown that he or she has been able to surmount the odds, even if the score is not exactly the best. That person individually deserves some kind of break. But if you do it collectively, if you say everyone who is black or everyone who is a Hispanic or everyone who is any one of a group, even women, that violates equal protection of the laws because equal protection of the laws applies to each individual. And that's why when you have affirmative action, 
first of all, I think it's unconstitutional. Okay, this, but, but how do you answer the yeah. argument that President Lyndon Johnson made, yeah. where he did in fact take up the point that you made, and he said that it's not just the individual, it's the whole group. The yeah. black community, <laughs> you say, you, you, you release the shackles to, from people who've been chained for generations, and how can you expect them to run as fast as those who've been uh, running and training for many, many years? And that, he said, is the reason why we need affirmative action. Well, the Supreme Court, <coughs> which has not been clear on affirmative action in other areas, has been very clear on this. What you describe, what Lyndon Johnson describes, is called societal discrimination, historic discrimination. If you can prove that a particular institution, whether it's a school or a college, has recent historic discrimination, that is anti-discrimination. There are laws against that. But, but if you say, <coughs> pardon me, that a whole society is guilty, how can you possibly redress that without injuring the people who are being discriminated against by, by affirmative action. Okay, but the people who are for affirmative action say mm -hmm. that in fact we have had institutional discrimination, that is societal discrimination, and that is why you need affirmative action to overcome the institutional discrimination. But you have to prove, at least this court says, we, we don't know what the next court will say, you have to prove that it, that institutional discrimination has occurred in this particular institution that, has brought the, that the case is being brought against or for, that it's, ha it's happened within recent years, that it doesn't happen in the 19th century. So, yes, you root out discrimination as it happens. That's why we have anti-discrimination laws. But if you're going to go on collective, what about the Jews who for many decades, and I'm an example of that, were told you can't, you can't go to certain colleges because they have Jewish quotas. Other groups, Italians have been discriminated against. An Italian couldn't get a job in a white shoe law firm for many years. So if you go into collective discrimination, then you're going to have the kind of chaos you now have in the Florida elections. So you would not be for any affirmative action? No, I'm for the William O. Douglas kind. Tell us, I th I how, think how does that translate into practice? In practice, you have admissions committees yeah. who look at the records, who look at the scores. They, now they look at notebooks and other kinds of anecdotal information, which may or may not be useful. But you, you look at a, at a student. The student, I mean, Douglas said this. He said, if somebody came out of Appalachia, bad schools, but somehow with his intellect and his determination, he got LSAT scores that were not as good as the, the son of a rich man, but were okay. He said that person should get preference <clears throat> because of his individual life experience and determination. Okay. That's the kind of affirmative action I mean. All right. That's, um, that is a, another view of how to deal with affirmative action, yeah. which is that instead of dealing with it on the basis of race, right. that the better way is to deal with it on the basis of class. That is, exactly. if, it's, if it's poor people, <clears throat> poor right. people, whether they're white, black, Latino, or whatever background, uh, who have not had advantages should get a preference. You support that kind of oh, yeah. affirmative action. Uh, class, class is a key factor. You look at the poor schools that are around. Middle class, upper class kids don't go to poor schools, by and large. They're not mm -hmm. as what they should be. But you look at, at, at the schools in poor neighborhoods, and by and large, they're inexperienced teachers and uh, kids drop out, nobody seems to care about it. So if you get that kind of discrimination by class, that should be taken into account. That that's an affirmative action that goes not by societal, historic discrimination, it's what happened to those students right now and in their own lives. Now you wrote in your article that, um, in a strange way, the end of affirmative action programs at the universities in California had resulted in a benefit uh, to yeah, black that was really something. The University of California, the newspaper said <clears throat> when Proposition 209 was passed, ending that kind of, oh, it's going to be calamitous. The sky is falling. What happened was that for the first time, the college presidents, some of the board of trustees, and the admissions offices went out and tried to get programs in the schools, starting in the middle schools, training teachers, getting students who are interested in science to have classes so they could study science. And as a result, the so-called disadvantaged, unrepresented students finally had a chance to learn enough so that they could get decent scores to get them into college. 
For the first time, this happened. Otherwise, the admissions people would sit in their offices. The president would say, we want diversity. But the kids, nothing happened for them. Because the, the crime in this country is what happens in the lower schools. Kenneth, Dr. Kenneth Clark, who spent his life and still does mm -hmm. fighting for decent schools, would say it happens in the first, second, and third grades if teachers say, well, these are kids from mean streets and the parent, they don't have a, a father, so they can't learn. That's what you have to focus on, not, not this kind of affirmative action by collective historic reasons. So the answer to affirmative action is to begin to uh, work with the uh, students in the first grade from Absolutely. a practical point yeah. of view. But if you can't do it in the first grade, you do it in the seventh grade, in the eighth grade. You, do, you, you work in community colleges so that they really are steps up to, 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 to regular colleges by merit. Now, you have a, you've written also about an organization called the Freedom Forum. Right. Tell us about that. Freedom Forum started with a man named Al Newharth. He started uh, USA Today and the whole Gannett newspaper industry, <clears throat> and he made a lot of money. And he's one of those people who uses money for what he considers a good benefit. And he's, he's very passionate about First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. This is an outfit. They have offices in Nashville at Vanderbilt University, in New York here, in Arlington, Virginia. They're about to have a big place in Washington. They do a lot of things. They are working on teaching teachers how to en enliven students' understanding of the Bill of Rights and the rest of the Constitution. They give curriculum materials. They have forms. Uh, is that for uh, elementary and secondary oh, yeah, schools yeah. Or, or universities? All the way through. Uh, they, they, do, uh, they have surveys, First Amendment surveys around the country, which have alarming results. People will say, yeah, we're for freedom of speech, but we don't think that uh, offensive material on billboards should be possible. Offensive to whom? And they put out, for, for reporters and anybody else who wants it, and I find it invaluable, it's a weekly sheet called a Legal Alert. And you find out what's going on all over the country, in courts and in legislatures, about free speech, free expression cases. They do a very good job. They now have a new television series that's be, that'll be on locally as well. Well, you know, we, we haven't resolved the problems of um, understanding the uh, Bill of Rights or the First yeah. Amendment in, in, in written uh, material or in uh, radio or television, but we have a new problem now, and that is in the Internet. <laughs> right? Uh, how do we deal with those problems? Well, <clears throat> you know, you can't regulate the Internet unless somebody's committing a crime, it seems to me. But it's kind of a paradox, it's an irony. Through the internet now, we have access to more information than anybody in the history of the world. But it's all diffuse, and a lot of it is unreliable, and you can't tell which is which. I do think that with all the kids getting onto the internet, I wish somebody would set up a website. In fact, a group has done this. It's called FIRE. It's called they're, they're a due process organization based in Philadelphia, and anybody in the country at a college, a professor, a student, who has been denied due process, usually by some politically correct administration, mm -hmm. can get advice and help from them. And for example, Columbia University, private university in this city, has the most atrocious new sexual misconduct policy. There is no due process. The person who's being accused cannot confront the witness. <clears throat> there is no burden of proof to, uh, that he, can, uh, he has to establish that. And FIRE has gotten the country, not an enormous number of people, but a lot of people, including alumni, calling Columbia, writing Columbia, saying, how can you do this? And the kicker is the law school at Columbia, a very prestigious law school, I called the dean. He said, well, we don't subscribe to that policy. I said, you're, you yes. mean you teach due process. That's the core of what you teach. And the but you're abandoning, violates it. you're abandoning the rest of the students to a university that doesn't understand basic justice. Well, uh, should there be any limitations on the uh, in Internet, in your opinion? Well, obviously, you know, the, the, if you find people using the Internet for predatory purposes to get kids in, uh, involved in sexual activity, that's a crime. Right. So there are crimes. I would be very, very reluctant to do anything. You know, for example, it sounds it's seductive to talk about filtering so kids don't get pornographic, obscene, whatever. But every filtering machine I know about, maybe they can do it better. If you have breast 
on that filtering, so mm -hmm. it, it, it's blocked out. What about people who want to know about breast cancer? Mm -hmm. So it's very chancy stuff. Uh, the, the answer should be parents should control it, but parents can't control anything these days. But there has to be a definition of what is a crime. And, and there, no, First Amendment is an absolute. You can't threaten people and mean it. Or what they call a true, threat, a, true, a true threat, that's a crime, whether you do it on the Internet or on the telephone. But to try to have some kind of broad censorship, you know, that failed. The Communications mm -hmm. Decency Act, yes. Supreme Court, nine to nothing. President Clinton wanted it. He urged the guy I know to write the brief for it, who was very embarrassed to do it. But he lost. But they keep trying. Okay. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you for being with us. Today. Thank you. You can reach us by email at our website, www.cuny.tv, or write to us at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016.